Now this is what DNA looks like in a cell, though not multicolored. Famous double helix of DNA. But it's not in our cells like a long stringy molecule. It's wrapped around eight protein molecules. Each of those protein molecules is shaped like a fist, and there's a cluster of eight of them. And what you can see is that there are these tails that stick out from the protein molecules. So you've got eight proteins together, DNA wrapped around them, tails sticking out. Now, this image represented the culmination of a huge amount of work by a lot of researchers. And it cost millions to generate the data that allowed this picture to be created. And it's fabulous, but from my point of view of trying to communicate something about science, it has some limitations. One is that if you're not used to these kind of pictures, it's a bit overwhelming. Whenever I put this picture up, I literally can see the audience kind of go, woo, right? So it's a bit overwhelming. The other issue with it from my point of view is that it's very difficult to adjust it to show you the things I want to show you. And so I decided I needed an improved version of this. So I created one. Now, mine was an improvement because it did not cost millions. I was able to adapt it to show you the things I needed to explain. And then once I'd adapted it and I photographed it, I ate it. Um, because mine is made from strawberry laces and marshmallows and jelly tots. Right? Now, I use the strawberry laces to represent DNA. Clearly, I've not tried to make them double-stranded, because that would be taking a confectionery-based joke too far. But they're going to be the DNA. The marshmallows represent those eight proteins that I told you about, those eight fish-shaped proteins. And the cocktail sticks, sticking out cunningly like that, are the tails that I showed you. Now, what happens in a cell? DNA wraps around a cluster of eight proteins. And then you get a little bit of DNA there, and then it wraps around another cluster of eight proteins. And so on and so on and so on. So you have millions of these clusters of eight proteins in our cells. And one gene, one bit of DNA that codes for a protein, will be wrapped around multiple clusters. Okay? So that's the basic structure. Well, how does that help us get any further in understanding what's happening to our genes? Well, do we have any present or former teachers in the audience? OK, you're going to relate to this. Let's imagine it's getting quite far on in the term, right? And you go home and you think, I'd like a little gin to take the edge off. <laughs> OK? So you have a little gin. And term continues, what feels like endlessly. And you start finding that now you need two little gins to take the edge off. <laughs> and the reason you need two little gins where before you only needed one, is because your body is breaking down the alcohol faster. It has switched on higher expression of the gene that breaks down alcohol. And the way that it does it is like this. Let's, well, not exactly like this, I admit, but yeah. Um, let's, this is the gene for breaking down alcohol, right? When there's lots of alcohol coming into your system, signals get generated in the liver, and you get little modifications added to the tails of those proteins, cunningly represented by the green jelly tots. Okay? And what those modifications do is they basically make it easier for that gene to be switched on. So they drive up gene expression. Let's say it gets to the summer holidays. Okay? After a week or two, you start thinking, I should really knock it on the head a bit with the gin. There's no point your liver continuing to make large amounts of the enzyme that breaks down the alcohol because you're not taking in the alcohol anymore. So the green modifications, the green jelly tots that basically said switch this gene on, are removed and replaced by purple jelly tots, which basically signal turn this gene off. Don't need to be breaking down alcohol at the moment. So what we have there is a way of turning genes on or turning genes off. And actually, it's massively more complicated than that. Imagine a world in which there were like 60 different flavors of jelly tots. And I'm so happy when I imagine that world, right? So you could have 60 different colors of jelly tots on that cluster. And 
They could occur in all sorts of different combinations. They wouldn't have to be all green ones or all purple ones. So you can see that what... And they could all influence gene expression by different amounts. So you can see you could start having a whole range of expression, not just off and on, but anywhere in between. Okay? So you can introduce enormous flexibility into how genes are expressed. But if we have a situation where we have lots of the purple jelly tots on lots of the protein clusters in the same region, what you can also get are modifications to the DNA itself, represented by the yellow jelly tots. And this says, I'm serious about it, I don't want this gene switched on. You can get very high levels of that modification to the DNA, and when that happens, the whole region of DNA scrunches up becomes incredibly compacted, and the genes there really can't ever be switched on. So it shuts down gene expression pretty much permanently of that gene. That's why the genes in our brain, for example, do not express the gene for home hemoglobin that carries oxygen around in our blood. They're, they're scrunched together early in development, and they stay switched off forever. So we have... We can use these sorts of modifications to switch gene expression off forever by this compaction. Or we can also have a more open situation where the gene expression can vary depending on the environmental circumstances. All of these modifications are called epigenetic modifications because they're at, on, or in addition to the basic genetic code. And what they all do is they change the likelihood of gene expression, but they never change the sequence. The gene still codes for exactly the same thing. 